So the objective for the next uh, 35, 40 minutes are threefold. One is we're going to develop the stress temperature diagram for a commercially relevant nickel titanium wire. And what I mean by that is one that we might sell, not a theoretical wire that's been fully annealed, but one that's been cold worked and aged. Um, two, we're going to talk about some new terminology, talk about some problems with the existing terminology and how we want to replace that. And we're going to talk a lot about some issues pertaining to the measurement of transformation temperatures, specifically regarding d sigma dt, or what we often call the stress rate. And to kind of kick it off and ground it, why this is important, I like metaphors. So this is a metaphor I really like. Imagine you're on Mars. The green line is where the uh, atmospheric pressure is on Mars. And you can see it's below the triple point of water which means there is no liquid phase. If you grew up on Mars, you would be unfamiliar with liquid. You would only know water in the solid form, ice, and in vapor. So if you imagine for a moment that you're an ice skater on Mars, uh, you might be very happy because on Mars, water is virtually always in the solid phase, so you could skate anywhere you can find water. On the hottest day, right at the equator, you might get a little bit of vapor, so you'd have to make sure you're not trying to skate on vapor. So the ice skater then decides it's time to go big time and go to Earth for the Olympics. <clears throat> and she Googles Earth and finds out that on Earth, the vapor phase doesn't form until 100 degrees centigrade. Okay? And she finds there's water everywhere. And ambient temperature is only about 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. So this sounds perfect. She can ice skate anywhere on Earth. After all, there's no vapor until 100 degrees C. So she goes to Earth, checks um, with Google one last time, asks Google when does vapor form, 100 degrees C, what's the temperature, 22 degrees C, and off she goes to skate across Lake Michigan and promptly drowns. And it's because she asked the wrong question. She got the right answer, when does vapor form, but what she would have, should have asked is when the low temperature, low entropy phase ice reverts. When does that low entropy phase revert is the question she should have asked. But what she's asked instead is when does the high temperature, high entropy phase form. And that is exactly the problem in our industry. What she asked is what's, where is AF? And what she should have asked is where is what we're going to call M star. So moving on. The first thing we want to do is to establish that same diagram we had in water but for nickel titanium. First thing we're going to do is look at the forward transformation, which means we're going towards martensite. We're going to cool. We're going to go towards lower entropy phases. So our first tool is stress strain curves, and we're going to use a unique sample for each curve. We're going to pull it at several temperatures, and we're going to look at this loading plateau. So don't be confused, this is all loading plateau, there's no unloading here. So we're going to map the loading plateau now, and we get something like this. So here's our stress, here's our temperature, and there's our first shot at a phase diagram. Martensite exists at higher stresses and lower temperatures, and below that we have marked parent phase. And I'll come back to that ambiguity in a little while, but for now I don't really know what the parent phase is, all I know is this is when I form martensite, because that's when the plateau formed. Okay? Now, if this is really a phase diagram, I should be able to traverse this line vertically or horizontally, and it shouldn't make any difference. That should be invariable or invariant to the direction I'm going. So what I can do now is I can say, well, let me apply different loads, fixed loads, and I'm going to cool down and see when I get a deflection. Okay, so now I'm going to cross the boundary this way. And I can do that. Here you see exactly that. We're basically applying different loads and we're measuring strain as we cool down. So here, for example, 300 megapascal, we get a strain. And we say that is the equivalent of the plateau, but moving in that other direction. Interestingly enough, just as we saw Luter's deformations or very steep curves, very flat plateaus, sorry, flat plateaus in the stress strain curves. We see exactly the same thing here. There are, in fact, Luter's bands as we cool down 
with a constant load. So strain is localizing. The reason they're not perfectly vertical is because this was done in a screw machine, the Instron, which cannot react instantaneously. If it could, if we had done this with fixed weights, these lines would be perfectly vertical. Now before we look at the data, one more thing. These are the equivalent of the stress strain plateaus, but here we have an outlier. Okay, at the very high load, 600 megapascal, we're not getting Luter's bands. We're not getting strain localization. Because of that, we really need to be looking at where the transformation begins, not where it is most active. Because Luter's bands or strain localizations are triggered at the beginning of the transformation. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So we plot up this data. Now we have the circles and the squares. The agreement is excellent, except at 600 megapascal, because that peak value, most activity, falls off the curve. But if I look at the onset, it actually falls exactly on the curve. So you, the strain localization causes the transformation to proceed at the beginning or Martin site start temperature. Still ambiguous with respect to what the parent is. Now very common in the literature would be to say, aha, that looks like a straight line. And we would fit a straight line and call it five megapascal per degree C. Unfortunately, that isn't quite right. I could also fit two straight lines to that and it would appear to be a better fit. One with a much steeper slope, almost twice as steep as the lower. But you don't do that willy-nilly. You need to have a, fa a sound rationale for using two straight lines. So we'll go back now to the origin of these points. Remember the loading plateaus and the movement of strain at different constant loads. And we'll start to look for where things, where the parent phase might be shifting. For example, the red curve starts very steep, okay, whereas let's say this purple curve comes off here at a very different slope. So you might suspect, aha, maybe the parent phase has shifted. Maybe that's what's going on. So it's easy to say, okay, these curves here have one parent phase. These curves here might have a different parent phase. They're going, by the way, to have the R phase as their parent. And same thing down here. You see this little blip and that's the R phase. And we're going to see that more vividly in a moment. But if you go to those curves, you can easily sort them out and say, aha, the R phase is the parent to martensite for some of those curves, and austenite is the parent for others. Now that doesn't give us the five phase diagram yet because we still don't have the boundary between austenite and R phase. And unfortunately, it's very difficult using those two tools specifically these two tools, to decipher exactly when the R phase takes over um, as the parent phase. For example, what's the parent phase on that orange curve at 500 megapascal? Difficult to say, okay? But fortunately, there's another tool we can invoke, and that's the electrical resistivity. So the electrical resistivity of the R phase is much higher than austenite. So if I take any nitinol wire or any object, a stent, and I cool it down, I get a sudden increase in the resistivity right when the R phase forms. So now I have my RS temperature for R start, R peak, and R finish, and now I can map things out the rest of the way. I can run this same curve at different loads, different stresses, and now calculate or now determine experimentally the austenite to R phase transformation. If I do that, by the way, I get curves that look like this. These are under load. So I have my different loads here, and I'm measuring resist resistance, not resistivity. So let's take one as an example. I have the purple curve. Purple curves, the resist resistance increases sharply at the RS, um, RP, RF. Then if we keep cooling, eventually it'll stretch. And even though martensite is a lower resistance or resistivity rather than R phase, I get an increase in resistance because it's elongating and narrowing in cross-section. So this is due to a change in resistivity. This is a geometric effect. 
but that means with resistivity, I can track the transformation from austenite to R phase, and then from R phase to martensite. Okay, so let's do that. Let's focus first now. I'm going to plot all these points on our curve, but let's first focus on just that R phase. When does the R phase form from austenite? I'm going to focus on these, the, the point again, the peak or most active temperature. I get a curve that looks like this, nice straight line, very steep. And if I take these data points and I superimpose them on my phase diagram, I get this. And now it's starting to look like a real phase diagram. Austenite, again, the high entropy phase. R phase, an intermediate phase equivalent to liquid and water. And then martensite, the low entropy phase, with three boundaries that I see here. Now, in principle, if I have this diagram, I've got all my stresses at all my temperatures. I've got everything I need to know to figure out how my material is going to behave. To get this diagram, I need three things, or well, two things. One is I need the slopes of these three. I'm going to conjecture for just a moment that those slopes are fixed. They can't change. They're crystallographically fixed. And I'll, I'll discuss that later, why that may or may not be true. But let's assume the slopes are fixed. Then all I need to do to really define the entire diagram is to measure this and this intersect. In other words, the stress-free R phase formation temperature and the stress-free martensite formation temperature. If I know those two intersections there, and if I go with the assumption that the slopes are fixed, I have the whole diagram, including the triple point. So if I do the extrapolation, I see the arc P should be minus 15, and martensite should form at minus 110. Now I'm a little vague here whether I'm going to talk about MS, the start, or the peak, because as I've said, stress-strain curves represent looters or stress localization, and when you have that, it actually begins somewhere between SP, MS, and MP. So let's see how I do. We're going to use the um, DSC, and the reason it's a little different is DSC is not going to have strain localization. So I do expect the DSC to come in with a number a little between MS and MP. Let's see how we do. Minus 15, minus 110. There's our DSC curve. I cool down. I form R phase, minus 14, perfect agreement. And then I get a little diffuse bump way down there. A little hard to pin that down. I mean, it could be right, but it's very difficult to pin down this bump. And the reason that's such a weak signal, by the way, is because delta H, which is one of the components that you're measuring in the DSC, we call it Q, the heat output, the latent heat is part of Q, and that's equal to the entropy difference between the phases times temperature. So as you go to very low temperatures, that contribution weak gets weaker and weaker and weaker, and the DS signal pro DSC produces an increasingly weak and diffuse signal that's problematic if we want to get these measurements. But there's a way around that. We're going to talk about the reverse curve in a minute, so just bear with me right now. But I see a peak here, which I'm going to represent as the reversion of martensite. And obviously, I can't revert martensite if I never form it. So if I had gone austenite to R and stopped, for example, here, then when I heat up, I should get no peak whatsoever. Whereas if I go all the way down to minus 150, I get a well-formed peak. Well, this peak is nice and strong and easy to measure. So instead of measuring this peak directly, what I'm going to do is to measure this peak as a function of how far I cooled. For example, there is that reversion peak versus different cooling temperatures. I can integrate that peak, and then I can plot the volume fraction of martensite versus how far I cooled it. And there is my martensite formation. As I cool it down, MS is minus 103, MP minus 125, MS minus 147. Nice curve, consistent, and what were we looking for? Minus 110 was supposed to be between MS and MP. Perfect agreement. 
So the DSC does in fact predict those two intersection points. Okay, that's the forward transformation. Cooling down, applying a stress, going towards martensite. Now we're gonna go the other way. Now that we form martensite, we're gonna revert it and take a look at that phase diagram. In water, of course, they superimpose, but here they're not going to. We're gonna get a different phase diagram for reversion. This time we're gonna look at the unloading plateaus. So again, we form martensite. Now we're gonna look at the reversion as we unload them. Here, on our, here are our unloading plateaus. Again, very, very flat, representing strain localization with the exception of 80 degrees. For simplicity, because it's not exhibiting strain localization or looter's behavior, I'm going to exclude that point. It shouldn't fit, and in fact, it won't. So let's exclude the 80 degree and stick with the other curves here. If we take a look at the, the cooling, this says cooling under constant load, that's an error. Record that as an error, that should say heating under constant load because we're reverting now. So we're taking the Martin site, we're heating up and taking a look at when the strain is recovered. Um, and we see our first problem. Let's take a look at the blue curve. What are we reverting to when we recover? When we recover, are we reverting to the R phase or reverting to the austenite? I can't tell by looking at that curve. But we don't have a term to say, I don't care. What I want to know is when it's reverting. So I'm going to have to invent some new terminology. I can't call it AS to AF or AP because I don't know that it's reverting to austenite. All I know is it's reverting to something. So I'm going to be ambiguous. I'm going to call it M star S for when it begins to revert, peak for when it's most active, and again, M star F when that reversion is finished because I don't have a terminology that works right now. And then I have my electrical resistivity, exactly what we had before. Let's take the green curve again. Here's my geometric recovery as the as it contracts, causing a change in the resistance. And then here is the change in resistivity as the R phase goes to austenite. Same terminology, R star, meaning reversion of R phase. Let's plot up all that data. And there's my three methods. Okay, we'll talk about the DSC in a minute, but there are my three methods. Again, a very nice straight line, bifurcating down here. So here's my austenite, there's my R phase, there's my martensite. So I have my reverse phase diagram now. And again, I can use my DSC to see whether we've got the right points. Uh, before we do that, I want to emphasize once again this concept of M star versus what the industry generally uses AF. If we were going to look at M star, what I'm talking about martensite reversion is this curve here. That's when martensite reverts. That's the equivalent of the ice skater asking the question that she should have asked, when does ice revert? What the ice skater did ask and the reason she drowned is she asked, when does steam form? When does the high entropy phase form? And there you see the difference and that's exactly what we do in our medical devices right now. We ask, where is AF? Well, AF is there, but that isn't the right question. The right question is, when does martensite revert? Okay, so there is a definite and important difference. So let's again, now let's go to the DSC. The DSC should read minus 15 degrees, same intersection we had on the forward transformation, minus 15 for that intersection, for R star, and M star ought to be at about minus 39 degrees. Let's see how we do. Okay, I see R star here at minus 11. That's pretty good agreement. It's not perfect. But actually it's even better than that because if I deconvoluted these two peaks, which I can do very, very easily using a method I just described, this actually would move down to about minus 13 degrees. 
and there's my M star. I said minus 39, it's coming in at minus 38. By the way, the way we would deconvolute these two peaks, dead easy, cool down to about minus 70, so you never form martensite. Then when you heat, you only get this peak, that peak doesn't even exist, so now you have the R star perfect. And then, if you want to deconvolute and isolate this peak, very easy, you simply subtract the curve that with just the R star from the combined curve, and you get the two individual peaks. So it's very, very easy to do. So once again, the agreement with DSC is very, very good. DSC is able to predict that phase diagram. But let's take a look at some other methods that are use, in use in our industry. Probably the most common method is what we call bend-free recovery, strain-free recovery. Crush a stent, bend a, bend a wire, whatever. There's an ASTM standard for it. You, could, you do that at minus 50, 60, 70. Heat it up, and there you see the recovery. Well, there's my M star at minus 32. Not as good agreement, not as good an agreement as I had with the DSC. Pretty good, but not as good. Well, there are several problems with the BFR test. It has its place, to be sure, but if you want to create a phase diagram and really understand your plateau stresses, BFR is not the tool you ought to be using. Some of the problems. When you bend a wire, you have a compression and a tension side. And of course, those have different d sigma dt's, they have different strains. That, by the way, also creates a non-uniform distribution and residual stresses. Um, and then you've got the problem that the ASTM only allows 2% or so deformation on the outer fiber of a wire. And if the outer fiber on the wire is bent 2%, that means the overall amount of martensite, the volume fraction of martensite you have in your device or wire, is probably less than 2 or 3% by volume fraction. DSC, it's 100%. And then you don't have strain localization for most of a bent wire or for most devices, whereas you do in tension. And that's what we're trying to do is emulate a pure um, uniaxial tension, tension test. So it's a problem if we're trying to do that and predict it based on something that isn't localizing the strains. And by the way, I'm using the, that term looters deformation and strain localization quite freely. There are probably a lot of people that aren't really familiar with what that is, and we ought to have a separate um, little seminar just to talk about strain localization, what causes it, and, and its implications. But for now, suffice it to say, BFR doesn't have strain localization. Uniaxial tension does, so you should not expect this to predict a uniaxial tensile behavior. Now, what we could do to get around a lot of these problems is not bend our wire, but we could stretch it 2% at a cold temperature, minus 60, minus 70, minus 80, then take the load off and simply heat it up and take a look at when the strain recovers in pure tension. That would get around the inhomogeneity. Um, this, in fact, it gets around all those problems. If I do that, I get a curve that looks like this, spot on with the DSC, minus 38 degrees, very, very good agreement, okay? I'm not gonna get into this. I just wanna make sure people are aware the phase diagram for the reversion is definitely affected by plastic deformation. Once you get out here to about seven or eight percent strain and you start going up the plateau on the, lo on the loading side, you'll find martensite is uh, suppressed. Okay. or martensite reversion is suppressed, meaning martensite is stabilized by the plastic deformation. Let me say it again because I just screwed it up. Um, martensite is stabilized by plastic deformation, therefore a phase diagram line will move as I deform the material. So we have data on that. I'm not going to get into the details, but I think you get the idea. You have to be careful, and that's why ASTM only allows the 2% deformation. Now we move on to the slopes, d sigma dt. So I talked about the two intercepts. There's my phase diagram, okay, that I just developed. I'm gonna look fo focus on the forward direction right now, but everything I'm going to say 
also pertains to the reverse direction, but let's just stick to the forward direction. Cooling down and loading. I made the statement that these slopes may be, quote, crystallographically fixed or determined. Now I want to discuss that and challenge it, because it's not quite true. Each phase, though, austenite has a certain entropy and has a certain uh, ability to accommodate applied stress. Okay, now that might be, in the case of austenite, simply it's modulus. You apply a stress and it creates a strain, um, just due to elasticity. In martensite, the ability of martensite to accommodate a stress is its modulus, but also its ability to morph or change shape due to the uh, detwinning process, or by just stress-inducing different variants. R phase also is a martensitic phase, so it too can morph. It too has a, an ability to choose the, the, most, the optimum variant. The strains are much smaller here than they are in martensite, but still it has that ability. So each phase has its own crystallography, which controls its entropy and controls its ability to accommodate an applied stress. So you might think, well, then they are crystallographically fixed. After all, the slope between two phases is equal to the difference in their entropy divided by the difference in their ability to accommodate strain, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. So yeah, you might say they're fixed, but not quite. First of all, if you do it in compression, delta epsilon is much, much, much smaller than tension. Okay, much smaller. So d sigma dt depends on whether you're doing tension, compression, torsion, the, basically the loading mode. It also depends on texture. Some textures are able to deliver much larger strains than others. A strong wire texture is going to have a very large delta epsilon between martensite and austenite, for example, and that will mean it'll have a lower d sigma dt than something that's equiaxed and fully annealed. Nickel content, as the nickel content goes up, delta epsilon goes up, and presumably delta S goes up. Although I don't know of any evidence for that, but it's likely that delta S would go up. And then as I said, the relative moduli of the phases also enters into the picture. So now let's take a look at what all this means um, on, to a medical device. So here I have my phase diagram. I've removed the data points for simplicity, but those are the actual best fit lines. There's my triple point where all three phases come together, just like the triple point of water, and body temperature. Now let's see what we can do with that. Well, if I cool down my alloy, cool down the transformation temperatures, uniformly, so now I've cooled down the martensitic, the, the uh, MS, and I've cooled down the R phase, I've moved the triple point down, and I've increased the plateau stress, the loading plateau. That all makes sense. You move down the transformation temperatures, plateau stress increases, and how much does it increase? Well, it increases by, let's call it an apparent modulus, in this case, 4.6 megapascal per degree C. Okay, we can go further though, and say that 4.6 is only an apparent modulus, and that can be calculated by a lever rule, basically, of the two moduli here, the austenite martensite and the R to martensite, <laughs> levered around the triple point. So that triple point plays a role, in fact, in determining the slopes of those, of the overall slope, the apparent d sigma dt, okay? I could then say, well, what would happen if instead of moving both of these transformation temperatures down, I had only moved down the martensite start, martensite peak, the martensite formation temperature? What if I had left the R phase where it was? Let's do that for just a moment. So now I'm going to leave the R phase formation temperature where it was, but move martensite down. What happens now is the triple point actually uh, um, goes up instead of down in temperature. The lever is changed, and my d sigma dt is now 4.1 instead of 
So even though you move this down, where the R phase is controls the triple point, and that controls the d sigma dt that you actually observe. And that's a point that is often ignored. Let's take an extreme example of that. And this is something that Ali is going to talk about shortly. Very, very interesting results that came out of some very low temperature aging experiments. I'm not going to talk about what the aging was. I'll let him do that. Suffice it to say that the red DSC curve represents what I would call a normal superelastic nickel titanium alloy. So again, two peaks on cooling, two close together peaks on heating. Now I'm going to expose that to kind of a unique low temperature aging regime. And let's take a look what happens. Let's start with M star. M star is not really changed. Not really changed. So consequently, because it's not changed, I would expect the unloading plateau to also be unchanged. Look at the stress strain curves, and that's true. That's just what you see. I see R star moved way up, and so did RP. So the R phase is now stabilized by this uh, heat treatment, dramatically stabilized. But I don't expect that to be represented in my curve at all, and it's not. But here's the weird one. I've moved my martensite formation temperature down sharply, what, 50 degrees or so. And yet the plateau, loading plateau, is unchanged. Okay, so I've suppressed martensite. I've made martensite very difficult to form, and yet the plateau is in the same place. It's unmoved. And why is that? It's because in the red curve, the operable d sigma dt is, again, levered around the r to m to a triple point. So I have a much different, I have a much lower d sigma dt, in, or I have a much higher d sigma dt, rather, in this case, in the red case, than in the blue case. Let's take a look at more detail. So here's what I've done in this case. I've moved R phase up sharply, not left it alone, but I've actually moved it up sharply. I've moved martensite formation down sharply. So I've suppressed martensite. I've stabilized R phase. Okay. Here's body temperature. If you focus now on the dashed lines, which is where I was originally, there is my loading plateau. But in this case, by shifting it in both directions and widening it, I have a d sigma dt that is much lower. It's no longer affected by this lever arm. It's strictly the m to a, or m to r um, um, slope. And I end up in exactly the same place, despite the fact that I moved this way down. I hope that's clear. I went from here. There's my d sigma dt of the red curve, OK? Conventional superelasticity. By moving the triple point, though, I, go, I have a much shallower d sigma dt. So even though I move this down, the stress doesn't change. So I go from, sorry, I go from there to there. Stress doesn't change even though I move the temperature down. So we have to be careful about that. Moving transformation temperatures down, they do, does not necessarily mean that the, the plateaus are going to change. Ali is going to show a, a much more extreme example of this, where we actually move the uh, R phase well above body temperature. And that's going to be even more extreme. Last thing I want to point out, um, and I've kind of slipped this in in the graphics already, um, and that is that the R to M transis is not linear. Okay. I said these transit temperatures are fixed according to delta S divided by delta epsilon. And delta S and delta epsilon are fixed if you know the texture, loading mode, and crystallography. The problem is the crystallography of the R phase is not fixed. It continues to change. It continues to the distortion increases as you cool it down. So as you cool it down, the difference in entropy between R 
and M decreases, and the strain difference increases. So d sigma dt, that slope, lessens as you cool down the R phase. And that was represented in this curve. You can see that this slope is not really a straight line. Now, how much it's curved, we don't have any idea. If you look at the raw data and you close your eyes, you can kind of imagine a little concavity in that curve. I wouldn't dare draw a conclusion based on that, but theoretically, it should be curved. Last point I want to make is can you predict the slopes, d sigma dt's, using DSC? We know we can predict the intersects, intersections, but can we predict the slopes as well? And the reasoning for thinking that you might be able to is that what the DSC is measuring, the heat flow, one of the biggest contributions to that is the latent heat of transformation. If we know the latent heat of transformation and we know the strain, we should be able to calculate the slopes. The problem is there are other contributions to Q, the heat flow, than just the latent heat of transformation. So in general, let's just say for Martin's site, those other contributions are going to be very large as in indicated by the hysteresis. But we might have a chance of just looking at the slope between austenite and R phase. And let's take a look at why we would have some hope for that. Here what we've done, the, um, let's follow the forward transformation first. Um, what we've done here is, okay, the forward transformation I'm cooling down. If I, if I integrate the DSC peak, okay, I'm going to integrate the peak that I formed as I cool down. I get a curve that looks like this. The dotted line is the resisti resistivity curve that I measured, perfect overlap. So the DSC and the resistance agree perfectly in both directions, forward and reverse. And there's almost no hysteresis, nothing I can measure. So I might think that the non-conservative contributions to the heat flow are negligible, and I should be able to calculate delta H. It doesn't work. If I assume a delta epsilon of 0.5%, which is our best guess based on what we measured, and if I make this assumption here, that delta H is about Q from the, the heat flow from the DSC, I would get about 29 megapascal per degree C slope, which is almost twice as steep as what I really get. So conclusion, I wouldn't try. It was worth a, it was worth a shot, but it doesn't appear as if the, it, that you can calculate the slope with a DSC. There are other contributions other than the latent heat which seem to be playing an important role. I would say if your sole goal in life was to measure AF, by the way, if you really cared after listening to all this about the AF temperature, there is no easier way than resistivity. Um, all you need to do is clip onto a stent or anything else, cool it down, and see when the resistivity recovers, uh, well, when you heat it up, when the re resistivity recovers. Um, very, very nice, elegant, fast, reproducible way of measuring AF. Unfortunately, um, not the question we ought to be asking if we want to ice skate on Earth. We come back to that. Earth is at a higher pressure. We do have three phases. We have the liquid phase in the water system. We have the R phase in medical devices, and we have to come to grips with that. We can't pretend that it's just austenite and martensite, just as the ice skater can't ignore the liquid phase. So in uh, conclusion, I guess what we're trying to do here is to introduce a new set of terminology that focuses on the reversion of these phases rather than the speculative formation of austenite. Um, the phase diagram, which every time you make a change in the texture or something else, it's going to change, but nevertheless, it gets across certain uh, points. And probably most importantly, DSC is a very, very good, effective way of predicting the phase diagram and therefore of predicting the stress-strain curves as a function of temperature. And that's it. Now, questions. Yes? I have a question. 
Go ahead. Um, so, what you mapped on the page diagram was the MP. Yes. Um, but I presume if, if we did that on MS and star, we would get the same. Thing. You would get the same thing. And, and actually, I think that would have been the more rigorous way of doing it. Um, because the stress strain curves are perfectly flat, and the stress, the strain recovery curves are perfectly vertical, it wouldn't move those data points at all. Um, the story remains unchanged. And I do believe very strongly that it's the MS that represents the onset of strain localization, which is really what we're trying to, trying to measure. You agree with that, Kaushik? So th that's really, if, if I had this whole thing to do over, I probably would just call it MS and M star S. Um, I'm really surprised by the results you obtain and how similar the results are resistivity versus your um, other analysis. I, I am really wondering how come it is that that much of a similar result. It, it was so surprising to me um, that we actually did this in air and we did it in floor inert. Perfect, perfect overlay. We change the scan speeds. Doesn't make any difference. Resistivity is one of the most underused. I mean, historically, it's very common. It's very common in the literature. But in industry, it's ignored. And I think one reason it's ignored is it is difficult to interpret. It, interpret. Because you have two things going on. You have the geometrical change and the resistivity change. Um, and if you're doing it under load, you got to separate the two extremely reproducible. You didn't, you see, so you didn't, um, that's not the instantaneous uh, cross-section, right? With that, uh, Wait a minute. these, these, these strains are too low to matter. Okay. Well, they matter, I mean, it, this, the correction would be negligible. When a customer comes to us with a, uh, a request for, for AF. <laughs> you, you do what they tell you to do. <laughs> um, no, seriously, I, I think what we have to do is to, is to teach, make people aware of this. The FDA gets this now, by the way. The FDA is really on a kick to convert. Uh, they want us to come out uh, in mid-July and present this to them. They want us to convert ASTM. Um, so they get it, um, but it's going to take years and years and years to get AF out of our vocab engineering vocabulary. In the meantime, yeah, I think you have to do what we do today with a lot of the new products. We measure and report AF religiously according to ASTM, but we also measure M star or directly the mechanical properties, and that's what we use internally to make sure we're shipping the right stuff. So I think you have no choice but to do both. 